No, we're in the right in, smack dab in the middle of a three-part series on Jesus praying in the garden. And I want to call your attention to the scripture text for this series of messages, Luke 22, beginning in verse 39. And I'm going to read all of that prayer, and we're going to go back and we're going to talk about a couple of those verses this morning. As you know, last week we talked about Jesus finding that particular place that he went in order to experience that Gethsemane, that, that, that pressure packed atmosphere that he was engaged in. And today we'll move a little bit further on in our prayer as we're going to leave the concept of the posture. And I appreciate your good comments about that last week as we looked at that in verse 41. Today we're going to focus on 42 almost uh, significantly and especially. But let me read the prayer starting in verse 22, or starting in chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. So you could follow right along there in your Bibles. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Now, what did Jesus pray? Saying, Father, if it is your will, Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you enter, that lest you enter into temptation. Well, I think the first thing we see in verse 41 and 42 is without exception the concept of the emotional side of Jesus. We see his feelings. You know, there's not anybody in the room that doesn't have feelings. We all do. Every one of us. We all have feelings. Now, over the years, you've, you've heard that. Uh, saying that some people wear their feelings on their sleeve. Well, that's not a very good thing to do because everybody has feelings and somebody might say something to you and you say, man, I'm worried my feelings on my sleeve and that just makes me mad and I'm just going to go pout and uh, you know, never get over it. That's not a good thing to do. Everybody has feelings. We, we have to understand that concept. This is a different kind of emotion that Jesus showed here. I, I like what's really told back in Matthew chapter 26. If you want to go back there, as the prayer is also found in three different places, one of those places is in Matthew chapter 26. And, and I really like what we read in Matthew's account. And notice what he says in 42. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus showed great feeling and great emotion here in this olive press, if you will. Also in Matthew chapter 26, if you look at verse 39, Jesus uses three very powerful words. Oh, my Father. And, and I, I really believe if we could get the voice inflection, you know, it's so different than, than us just, just reading maybe three words. You know, if I'm just casually reading this and I don't put my emotion into it, here's the way I might read this. Oh, my Father. But I don't think that's it at all. Because of the feeling and the emotion, it's, oh, my Father. We, we talked last week a little bit about that posture, how, how, how he, he, he knelt down. And, and the other versions say that, or the other uh, places in Mark and in Matthew say that he fell to the ground or he fell on his face showing that, that he experienced tremendous emotion in, in, in doing that. And so read this this way. Oh, my Father. Great, great feeling in his gut, if you will. 
So there's how that needs to be read. And the reason why Jesus is saying this is because right now his grief is in overdrive. It's in high, high gear. And, and, and the reason why, if you look on the screen, we've, we've got a couple of readings here. The reason why is because he's about to experience taking upon him the sins of the entire world on his back and on his shoulders. That's why the writer Isaiah said in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Watch this. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. So he's saying in this context, Oh, my Father, this cup. And what was the cup? The cup, if you read Revelation 14, verse 10, the cup was the wrath of God that was going to be poured out on sinful people. And still today, we have to come to the realization that at the judgment bar of God, when that time comes, God's wrath is still going to be poured out on folk who do not obey His gospel who do not believe his word, who do not follow his way, who rejected him on this earth. The wrath of God is going to be poured out. And so Jesus is experiencing all of that while he is in this olive press, while he is in this garden of Gethsemane that we talked about last week as we introduced this prayer. Now, as we continue to think about this, Look on the screen because I really believe that this is what is going on. My soul, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Now that wasn't his physical heart. That would be his spiritual heart. And I think there are two things that encompass the spiritual heart. And, 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 and here's what those two things are. The spiritual heart is encompassed with two things. Number one is the emotion that stems from it, but also the volition or the choice. Did you notice what he said? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's volition in saying, I'm going to do, Father, what you want me to do. I'm going to do, Father, what is best. Do I want to go to the cross? Does any human want to experience pain? Does anybody in this room want to go through a root canal? I mean, you know, I don't know anybody say, oh, great, I got a root canal tomorrow. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> we don't do that. We dread it like a toothache. No pun intended. But you know, we, we, we dread it. We don't look forward to that. We don't like those procedures. We don't like those things. We don't like pain. Jesus knew what the cup was about. God's wrath was going to be poured out. Did he want to go through it? No. Father, I want to do what's best. That, that's really the overall, I believe, concept of all three lessons is understanding that, that Jesus is saying, Father, do what's best. You remember a number of years ago, I, I promise you, I don't even remember this. I've just heard about it. The sitcom, Father Knows Best. Some of you remember that. You got to be kind of up there in years. How many of you remember Father Knows Best? Let's go to the all right, a lot more than I thought. A lot, a lot more older people here. Uh, but, but <laughs> Father knows best. Well, what, what Jesus is really saying in that context, Father knows best, so I'm going to do what's best for the Father and for His people. And you know, I kind of get that sense in Psalm 140. When, when David had so many problems and so many reverses that, that David began to pray for deliverance. I just want to go back there and read the first three verses of Psalm 140. If you don't mind there, let's just go back and I'm going to read the first three verses. And you'll get a sense of David saying, I am asking for deliverance. And I really believe that's the thing, same thing Jesus was praying for in the garden. Let me read these three verses to you and you follow along in your Bibles. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Now, now that word asps, A-S-P-S, -S, it's, it's a hard word to say. 
But what that is, or what that was, I should say, that was a poisonous, venomous snake in Egypt, in times of Egypt. And, 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 and what, what, what David is saying is that these people are after me and, and, and they're, like, they're like poison. They're like poison and they, they, they want to do me harm. And God, I'm asking that you might deliver me from that. And it was also, if you read two places that Paul experienced the same thing as we fast forward a few years. Paul experienced the same thing. Let, let me go in Romans 9 and 10. And if you want to quickly go there, we'll look at that. Romans 9, 1, 2, and verse 3, and Romans 10, verse 1. Let's, let's look at this together real quick and see if you don't see Paul's sense of desire and deliverance in these verses. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. It wasn't in his physical heart. It was in his spiritual heart where those emotions for, were, where that volition was. That, that's what he's talking about here, the spiritual heart. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. And he goes on to even say this in chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God is that all of Israel, all the Jews, all the Jewish nation might be saved, but Paul knew they were too stubborn, they were too obstinate. But that was, in his, that was in his heart, if you will. So the first thing I want you to see this morning is, is the concept of feeling and emotion. But the second word I want you to think about with me today is Father. 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 And we have a young lady in this room who knows Aramic, am I right? Alex, she knows it, and, and she can attest to what I'm saying is true here. When Jesus said, Abba, Father, Aramaic, it's like, Papa, Daddy. It, it, it's close. It's a connection. Father, oh, my Father. And you have to understand the sense in which Jesus was saying this because he knew that his time was brief. When you look at the book of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, seven times Jesus will say, Father, and go on with the discourse. But 17 times he says, My Father which is in heaven. He knew where God was because he left the right hand of God to come to this low land of sin and sorrow and to live for people, for men and women and boys and girls. You know, and I don't want to you know, turn this into some type of sob story today, but you know, the word father means a little bit more to me today because my own physical father is teetering between life and death even as I speak. And so that, that, that connection, that, that closeness, it just, it just it means a little, little bit more to me today than maybe it did a week ago. Father, Papa, Daddy. And then I want you to see in Luke 22 and in Matthew 26, the concept of faith. Nevertheless, not my will, not my desires, not what I want. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's faith. That's saying that God is going to take care of me. God's going to do what's best. Again, that same concept. God's going to do what's best. What I'd like for you to do is, on this point, I'd like for you to go to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. And I think we see three things here about faith that I'd like to call your attention to. James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, 4, somewhere along in there. 
James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, watch this, that the testing of your faith, what does it do? It produces patience. As patience has its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Watch five. Here's the clincher. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and, and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If we do what? If we ask in faith, Jesus is asking in faith, Father, oh my father, Papa, Daddy, if, if, if I, I wish this cup could pass for me, but, but nevertheless, not my will but yours be done, that's, that's asking in faith. And I think you see three things there. I think faith are these three things. I think faith is accepting, and that's hard to do. You, you have to accept the outcome. You don't always like the outcome. It's not always favorable to us on the short term. But faith is where you begin to accept. And you take it that next step, then you, once you accept, you just say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to accept that, I'm going to trust God in the process. And you begin to, you begin to trust. You, you begin to trust God to do what? To do what's best. Do we ever really want to give a loved one up? No. But you know what we want to do for them? What's best. That's what we want to do. And so faith is, is accepting it is trusting. And then, and then I think the last step is just this. It's just believing. I believe God so much. He's going to take care of me. He's going to encourage me. He's going to strengthen me. He's going to help me. He's going to aid me. He's promised he would be with me. So why don't I just put it in God's hands? It's all about God anyway. When you boil it all down, it's about God. And so this morning, I want you to see those three F's. Feeling, emotion that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane. The fact that he, that he called upon his Father. And he did it in faith. Well, that leads me to do this. I want to, I want to close the same way we closed last week because I, I just don't think it can get any better than this. And for me this week, this has been so very helpful for me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18, because these are three imperatives. How's this work? Number one, you, you rejoice always. You say, what, what about if things aren't favorable for you? Maybe God's working it out in your favor in the future. See, we have a tendency to look, well, what's going on right now? Maybe God's working on it in the future for you. That's why you got to think of it. So rejoice always. And number two, as you rejoice, make sure that you pray without ceasing. You know, we've done a lot of fervent, heavy, closet, on your knees praying the last few days. That God would do what's best. Not for us, but for our Father. Do what's best for Him. And then verse 18. As you pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Why? Watch this again. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You remember what we said in Matthew 26, Luke 22? Not my will, but yours be done. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I have to understand sometimes that the will of God must take precedence over everything else in my life. So that's where your faith comes in, where you accept, you trust, and you believe. There you have it. Jesus praying in the garden. You have listened great. And I really do appreciate that and respect that and thank you for it.